Thanks again for the invitation to speak here. So I guess I should apologize for not giving a plan for my lectures yesterday. Um, uh, so uh, the second lecture today will be some of the discussion of an example of uh, <coughs> of what some of my theorem is about. And uh, then tomorrow's lecture, uh, I will explain the strategy of the proof. And then in the last talk, um, I will probably explain some of the uh, ingredients of this proof more precisely. So. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> so maybe I just begin by stating a rough form of the general theorem I prove. So, so I have f a number field, and I assume that either f is totally real, meaning that all embeddings into the complex numbers in fact factor over the real numbers. Or F is CM, meaning that it's a quadra quadratic extension of a totally real field which is totally complex. Um, and then there is some locally symmetric space XK uh, for this for GLN over this field F, any N, um, where K is some level, and I guess I'm implicitly working here in the eidetic setup. And then the theorem is that uh, the rough form is that. Uh, uh, If the homology of this guy is non-zero, say, then there exist Galois representations Rho, um, from of the absolute Galois group of this totally real OCM field into an FP bar, and more precisely, I should say that this matches up. Uh, Frobenius eigenvalues uh, with Hecke eigenvalues. Frobenius traces, sorry. <laughs> Equal to Hecke eigenvalues. <clears throat> uh, but as I said today, I just want to explain an example. So let me specialize the whole discussion to the case again. Uh, where n is 2 and k is an imaginary quadratic field and I choose the Euclidean numbers for this, uh, the Gaussian integers for this, sorry. Um, so in this case, this locally symmetric space, um, so the symmetric space, first of all, uh, it's hyper three dimensional hyperbolic space and so one model for this is that it's the complex numbers times the positive reals. F, sorry, yes, <laughs> F. Um, and so if I uh, take coordinates x i plus x1 plus i x2 and y, uh, then the metric on this guy is this thing over y squared. Three-dimensional hyperbolic space. And in this case, a group of uh, self-isometries is uh, 
PSL2 now of the complex numbers. Um, and I won't give you the formula for the action because it's somewhat complicated. Um, so that's the set of orientation preserving isometries. Okay, and again, I fixed some congruence subgroup. So. And because in this example, I don't want to talk about the eidetic setup so much, um, I will again assume that this, is, that this contains a subgroup of the form gamma 1 of n. which is again the set of all gamma subset. Uh, modern it has this form. Um, and so then we can form this locally symmetric space H3 mod gamma, and this is what's called a Bianchi manifold. Um, so these were introduced in two centuries ago already, um, 1892, by this Italian differential geometer. So they really arose in differential geometry first, Luigi Bianchi. Um, okay, and actually, if you draw a picture of this, uh, it looks pretty similar to the case of the modular curve. So. Um, so what does a complex upper half space look like? Uh, this uh, hyperbolic three space look like? Well, instead of some other line downstairs, you have this whole complex plane downstairs, and then you have this whole uh, hyperbolic space above it. And now inside the complex numbers, you have the ring of integers Z adjoint I uh, of uh, of this chosen number field, uh, which gives you a lattice. Uh, downstairs, and then again you draw these straight lines up. <coughs> and so in the case of the uh, modular curve, what you did is you draw these, drew these uh, half circles around, uh, centered at each of these points, and now you draw these half spheres centered at these points, which I'm not sure whether I will succeed in doing this. So. I'm not sure this is a really nice picture, but but uh, I'm not sure this succeeds. Well, anyway, some of the a fundamental domain now of gamma sub four as L two of the Gaussian integers. The fundamental domain is again some of the area within. Uh, within this, um, what is it called? Um, within this tower here, um, and which is bounded by these half spheres downstairs. So that's a fundamental domain. And again, this guy is not compact because he can somehow go off to infinity in this direction. Um, but there are some important differences. So uh, note that this guy has real dimension three. Uh, so just, just because it's an, of odd dimension, it has no chance of carrying a complex structure. <coughs> and so of what theory, it cannot carry any algebraic structure. And so this also means that uh, on this object I'm interested in, on this homology group of this guy with some torsion coefficients, 
there's no Galois action. <coughs> and so in the case of the modular curves, this is really where the Galois representations came from, but now they're just not there. So it's somewhat much more mysterious where these Galois representations come from in this case, because they, well, not in, they're not there in the obvious way. Um, what else do I want to say? Um, ah, I also wanted to say that this guy has lots of torsion. So, uh, I just want to give some prototypical example of the behavior. So, uh, if my congruent subgroup is a congruent subgroup corresponding to a prime P, so gamma naught of P for some uh, prime P whose norm, so I take a specific value, but some of the behavior is the same for any nearby prime. Um, so in this case, if I look at the order, so I look at the integral homology group and look at its torsion subgroup, and it's some finite group, and I can look at the primes dividing its order, and there's one really big prime, so eight, seven, two, seven, two, nine, three, seven, one, zero, eight, seven. <coughs> so that's a prime number. And so I took this example from a paper of Sengun. Hmm? I think you can compute these homology groups by some, uh, uh, what's it called, modular symbols kind of stuff. So, I mean, you can really compute these guys. Uh, so one way, I mean, you can actually somehow compute these fundamental domains. And, and, I don't know. I think so, yeah, yeah. Uh, and in fact, one expects exponential growth. Of the torsion subgroup. Uh, subgroup. With respect to the volume of this hyperbolic extreme manifold. Uh, and in closely related cases, uh, such results were first proved by Bergeron and Venkatesh. So contrary to the case of the modular curve again, where there was no torsion at all, for these hyperbolic streaming faults, which we have here, they're really huge torsion subgroups, and they But what the theorem tells us is that they still uh, carry interesting uh, arithmetic information because they are a Galois representation attached to them. So, well, theorem gives the existence of big sporadic extensions of F. Uh, with relatively little ramification. So in this example, we only made the level smaller at one prime, but still there is a Galois group representation to this huge group GL2 of a finite field with that order. Uh, and when the construction of this Galois representation shows that it's unramified outside uh, this prime P and uh, this prime. Okay. This exponential growth is also true prime by prime, or it's only for all constants? 
Uh, what do you mean? I think what you do is you look at subgroup of form gamma naught of p, and then you let p somehow go to infinity. I think that's the way they phrase it. And then only let's make the level at p larger. Um, I, in that case, one knows the exact growth by Iwasawa theory, actually. Um, but I would have to check whether it's in that case exponential. Uh, maybe, well, I don't want to say anything because I'm confused. Um, okay. Um, okay, so what do I want to say? So, I should also say this is a uh, theorem here was uh, expected, something of this form was expected uh, since the 1970s. Uh, so, there were some examples of Fritz Grunewald. Uh, uh, that uh, made it plausible that such a statement might be true. Uh, and then it was a precise conjecture in the case that this number field is the rational numbers was made by Afnarash in 1990. Um, okay, maybe I should also say uh, one word about what the SEC operators are. Uh, because they are somewhat critical to the exact formulation of this uh, theorem. Um, so for this, let's fix some prime p in the ring of integers of my field f. And so I'm still implicitly thinking about, so I'm only doing it in this case. Uh, so p does not divide my chosen level. That's some prime idea. Uh, and so because I'm in this case, uh, this prime ideal is actually principal, so I can choose a generator. And then I can look at subgroup gamma sub p, which is the intersection of my subgroup gamma with uh, some conjugate of it. And uh, then I have this Hecke correspondence, so I can cover this with the subgroup where I divide by the smaller subgroup gamma of P, um, but that's isomorphic to the one where I conjugate the subgroup by this element. Why is the action of this element? So why is the action of pi 1? And then again, I can project this because now this guy, now the gamma is again a subgroup of this guy because I took this intersection, so I can project this again. So I have two projections, pi 1 and pi 2. And then Tp, which is by definition uh, pi 2 lower star. Well, if I have a homology class here, I can pull it back, but because uh, pi 1 and pi 2 are both finite covering maps. I also have a push forward map, some kind of trace map. Uh, so this uh, acts on all the homology groups. The basic fact about this is that uh, the TP commute <clears throat> and so this implies that there exist simultaneous eigenvectors. Uh, in 
this characteristic P situation, it's not true that it's the same as simple as a module over the Hecker algebra. So you don't have a basis of Hecker eigenvectors. So you can have some generalized eigenvectors instead. Right. Okay. So those are the so called Hecker eigenforms. And so the more precise form is that if I take Uh, for primes not dividing p and uh, the level, be a system of Hecker eigenvalues. Appearing in such a homology group. And one can, in fact, reduce to the case where i is equal to 1. So the most interesting case is the homology group in degree 1. Um, uh, then there exists a Galois representation rho alpha of the Galois group of this totally imaginary, of this imaginary quadratic field going to GL2 FP bar um, such that uh, for all primes which do not divide p and the level, uh, so this is unramified outside p and the level. Uh, the trace of the corresponding Frobenius element is equal to. So again, this means that somehow this group, which is defined in purely topological in a purely topological manner, someone knows about Gara representations, but there is not at all any evident link between the two worlds. <coughs> because it's GL2 somehow. I mean, even if there was a Gal so even in the modular curve case where there is a Galois action, it's somehow Maybe a surprising fact that all irreducible subquotients have dimension at most two. Um, yeah, as I said, some of the general case you get representations into GLN. If you look at the locally symmetric space for GLN. It's kind of hard. I mean. Yeah, it's not, no. I don't think there's an evident way to see this. I mean, in, so if you look at characteristic zero cohomology of the sky, then you know that this can be expressed in terms of automorphic forms, and then you can ask whether this automorphic form is somehow cusp law. So in that case, you expect, I mean, there's a similar theorem which works in characteristic zero, which says that if you have uh, cohomology in characteristic zero, then you get Galois representations to characteristic zero. In that case, you would expect that if you start with some cusp law, representation that the outcome is an irreducible Galois representation, but also that is not clear. And it's even, I think it's totally unclear what the correct analog of this, uh, of the statement would be in pure characteristic P. Okay. And for most of the rest of today's lecture, I want to explain what this actually means in an example. And I took this example from the uh, thesis of Figueredo. So, so as before, my, I'm in the case n is 2 and this field is q to an i. Um, now I fix a specific small prime p, and this will be p equal to 3, just uh, in order that this Galois representation is something manageable. So GL2 of 3 is still a group you can understand, but GL2 of this big prime there is probably not so easy. 
and it's not so easy to write down the corresponding number fields. So uh, F3, I denote as elements by zero and plus minus one. Um, and so what's the congruence subgroup I'm looking at? So the congruence subgroup gamma will be uh, subgroup gamma one at three intersected with a gamma zero at 61. So meaning it's a set of gamma such that gamma is congruent to star star zero one mod three and gamma is congruent to star star zero star 61. And well, you should really think of 61 as being two primes because it decomposes in this, in this uh, field F. <coughs> and so that's contained in a slightly larger group gamma tilde, which is uh, gamma three at zero. Second, gamma zero at 61. And uh, the quotient gamma, so gamma is a normal subgroup of gamma tilde. And uh, the quotient gamma tilde mod gamma, uh, well, it's just some, uh, I put a star here, but the star can only be plus or minus one. So the quotient is just F3 cross. Um, and so this has a tautological character uh, going to F3 cross. And then I notice this by chi. And uh, this group also acts on the first homology group of H3 mod gamma uh, with coefficients in F3. Okay. And uh, so what Figueredo calculated is that um, if I look at this group and then <clears throat> look at the part where this group uh, acts via this character chi, so that's what's called the neben tuples. Oh. <clears throat> this thing has, di uh, has dimension two. And there in that case, you actually have a basis of uh, Hecker eigenforms, and so there are two Hecker eigenvalue systems. Alpha one and alpha two. And And uh, I want to give the first few of those. So let me order my primes according to their norm. And so for norm two, there's the prime one plus i. For norm five, there's two of them. For norm 13, there again two. And uh, I will actually only write down the norms to save some time. 41, 49, and 53. Okay. So, um, so then you have alpha 1 at P and alpha 2 at P. <coughs> and it's not a priori clear that the outcome will be the same for any primes which have the same norm, but in this case, it turns out to be true. So, uh, one, 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 17 is also one, then I have minus one, zero, zero, minus one, zero. And alpha two is minus one, minus one, 
1, minus 1, 1, 0, 0, minus 1, 0. Okay? So again, you can write a program uh, which spits out these numbers. And uh, I think, I mean, that's, that's all the numbers that Figurato wrote down in the thesis, but I think he computed this for the first 100 primes or so. Um, and so let's make some observations about this table. The first is what I already said, that somehow it's not a priori clear that I can really write the table as I did by somehow combining entries with the same norm. So the first observation is that I2 or P. That P bar denotes a complex conjugate prime, which is the same prime is the same norm. And the second observation, oops, ah, that uh, it appears that one entry is zero and only the other entry is zero. So. Ah, sorry. Uh, yes, uh, that's probably obvious by this part. So alpha one and alpha two. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, it's actually true that both of these can be proved uh, directly without knowing anything about the theorem. Um, in the sense that if you compute this for the first few primes, you can deduce that it always has to happen. Right, the first can be interpreted in this way. That is a base change from something from Q. But uh, you actually can, uh, you can somehow act by complex conjugation also on this, uh, on this hyperbolic three manifold, which gives you an automorphism of this, and this also commutes with hack operators, and this way you can show that uh, it's, if some eigenvalue system appears, then also the eigenvalue system appears, which so I'll switch is P and P bar. Uh, but so sum of for alpha one, something has to appear which is the same, well, which has the symmetry, but it's not alpha two because it's different here, and so it has to be alpha one itself. Well, anyway. So what does the theorem tell us? So the theorem tells us that there exist representations rho i uh, from the absolute Gara group. <coughs> well, in this case, it's also true uh, that all the Hecke eigenvalues will actually be numbers in F3 and not in F3 bar. And this also means that this Gara representation will actually go into GL2 F3 and not into GL2 F3 bar. So it's actually a representation to uh, GL2 S3. Um, you know it's unramified outside 3 and 61. And um, by a property that I didn't state, you can deduce that the determinant is actually 1. Uh, this uses that we are restricted to the part of Neben Chipus Chi. So in this way, you can actually replace this GL2 by an SL2 F3. Uh, now let's remark the following. So uh, if we let chi 3 uh, be the mod 3 
circuitomic character. Um, then this is ramified only at three. Uh, and so, if I take one of these representations that I get out of this and tensor it with this mod 3 cyclotomic character, then this satisfies all the same assumptions. All the same statements. And so, one might then ask oneself whether it's in fact true that row two is just a twist of row one by the smart three cyclotomic character. Um, so what does this mean? So that's equivalent to alpha two p being the product of alpha one p with chi three of the Frobenius at p, and that's actually easy to evaluate. So that's one if uh, p is one mod three, and it's minus one if norm of p. Oh. Am I doing it correctly? I think so. It's minus one mod three. And so let's check this. So we have chi three of the Frobenius at p, and so. 2 is minus 1 mod 3, 5 is minus 1 mod 3, 13 is 1 mod 3, 17 is minus 1 mod 3, 29 is minus 1 mod 3, I hope, yes. Then this is 1, this is minus 1, I guess. This is 1 mod 3, and this is minus 1. And uh, you see that in all columns where there is potential information, it actually works out. Um, and it also implies this behavior that one is zero if and only if the other one is zero. And again, this can be proved. So. <coughs> Without using the color representations, yes. Okay. So, but still, what is the scholar representation? So let's concentrate on uh, this eigenvalue system alpha one. So because the other one is just a twist, so we, there's not much information there. Uh, so let's call rho this representation rho one, uh, which goes from the absolute Gara group. to S3. And uh, as Dependra Prasad remarked, um, this property that uh, you get the same answer for any complex conjugate primes means actually that the scar representation extends to a gar representation of the absolute gar group of Q. So, Call this Rotilda. Uh, and it goes to GL2S3. Um, but actually, the group GL2S3 is a bit too big for me. So uh, let's, for the moment, consider uh, this representation Rotilda uh, bar, which goes. to PGL2. And uh, if you think about it, that's just a symmetric group on four elements. And so 
uh, this gives rise to a degree 4 extension uh, L over Q, which is unramified outside 3 and 61. So this degree 4 extension is not normal, but if you take its normal closure, then it will be contained in S4. So what you do is you, this acts on a four element set by taking some of the tautological S4 guy, or by letting PGL2 S3 act on the projective line over F3. <coughs> so somehow what we, what we concluded just from this picture is that uh, there has to be some degree 4 extension uh, L over Q, which is unramified outside six, 3 and 61. And, well, then there is a very short list of such. And, uh, uh, so if you would know that this extended representation of Tilda would actually take values in SL2, then this would also map into PSL2, which is A4. And the fact is that there exists a unique A4 extension uh, of Q, which is unramified outside 3 and 61. And this is the splitting field of the following degree 4 polynomial of x to the 4 minus 7x squared minus 3x plus 1. Okay. And so now how can we check whether this representation actually has some, this polynomial actually has something to do with these Hecker eigenvalues? So the following are equivalent. Uh, The first is that P, so for P not dividing 3 times 61, uh, P has a root mod P, what's this prime? So there exists an X and P join I, such that P of A, 0 mod P. And <coughs> Let me only write down the thing that we can actually easily verify, and that's that if you take, if you apply rho to the Frobenius of P, so you get this element in SL2FR, and somehow in this business we essentially only know the trace, and so, but we can actually verify this in terms of the trace. Let's trace either plus or minus one. Okay, so oops. Um, if I write down this polynomial x to the four minus seven x squared minus three x plus one, then for those first five primes we hope to find a solution. For those two primes, we hope that there is no solution. For this prime, we hope, again, that there is a solution. And then here there should be no solution. And as it turns out, in this case, x equal to 1 is the solution. Uh, in this case, x equal to minus 2. Then x equal to 6. Then x equal to 2. Then x equal to 8 is the solution. Uh, then there is no solution. Then there, again, there is no solution. And then x equal to minus 3 is a solution. Then again, there is no solution. Yeah. I find this quite funny. Um, so it says that these numbers, which you get by some computer program, which splits these out for you, 
And the answer will be plus or minus one exactly when there's somewhere a solution to this equation mod p. But uh, it absolutely doesn't tell you how to find the solution. And so, uh, I mean, even, uh, even proving such a down-to-earth statement in some sense, I mean, there is this program which computes these numbers. Um, but even in this example, you can just numerically verify that it actually is true for any example that if it spits out plus or minus one, then there is a solution. But even this example, you can't prove it somehow without all this machinery that I'm about to talk about. Because there is somehow no way you can relate this geometry of this hyperbolic stream manifold with this specific polynomial there. It's just that you know abstractly by the theorem that there is some Gaur representation, but then you somehow have no, no other possibility of choosing this polynomial. There's just this one, and so it has to be this one, and then it does work out. This, the last column can't be proved directly. So you can't, I mean, the statement that, this statement, does this come from a weight one form? Um, I'm about to discuss this. Uh, so as a final thing for today, I want to place this example in some um, wider context. So, uh, where am I here? Um, so, so, further remarks. So actually, uh, this representation of uh, the absolute Gaia group of Q there is for tilde. It goes to SL2 F3 still. So that's because we have this, that's an A4 extension there. Um, uh, and this is an even representation. Uh, meaning that the image of complex conjugation is uh, plus or minus the identity. Um, and so, this means that it does not... So yesterday I said that essentially all finite color representations should come from the homology of the modular curve in this case, but I was lying a bit because only the odd ones should com come from there. And the even ones, they shouldn't come from there. Um, so this does not arise uh, from the homology of the modular curve. However, this example shows that if you restrict this to this uh, imaginary quadratic field, then it does come from this, uh, from the homology in this hyperbolic stream manifold. And so what happens here is that as soon as I, rest as I restrict this imaginary quadratic field, this even odd distinction goes away because it comes from the complex conjugation, which comes from the real place. Um, Okay. 
Okay, and how does this fit in with characteristic zero forms? So we can lift or tilde to, no, I shouldn't call this or tilde tilde. Um, Let's call this R. Um, from the absolute Gara group Q to SL2 of C. Uh, so there exists a lifting of this group SL2 F3 into SL2 C. Um, and so this is now an even Artin representation. And in this case, I may, uh, this group is solvable. So in this case, it is known by work of Langlands and Tunnel. Uh, that this comes from a mass form of eigenvalue. So Laplacian eigenvalue, a quarter the modular curve. So that's, that's a non-holomorphic form. Um, and it's something there's most uh, mysterious forms around these mass forms. Um, and it's not known for a general even Artin representation that there is this associated mass form. It's because we, I have, this has rather small image. It has solvable image. For this reason, you know this. Um, so, again, such forms are not seen by by the homology. But so what happens here suggests the following picture. So it is expected that if you have any mass form of Laplacian eigenvalue a quarter on some modular curve H2 mod gamma, it's called this gamma of N. Um, that there should be a way, uh, which is totally unclear, uh, to attach to this guy a Gara representation. See an even Artin representation. <coughs> but assuming that I would have such a gadget, uh, I might reduce modulo any chosen prime p. So what I get is some row bar. which goes into GL2 F3, FP bar, sorry. But it's still even, so it still doesn't arise in the homology of this modular curve, but I can uh, restrict to some imaginary quadratic F. And get some row bar restricted to the Gower group bar of f, which goes, and still to GL2 f p bar. <coughs> Any imaginary quadratic, yes. And really what I said so far uh, in this example where f is q join i uh, really works in general. I was only taking the example uh, to avoid having to talk about the eidetic setup because uh, it's class number one, so things simplify. Um, and, but then, 
uh, this even odd distinction has gone away after restricting to this imaginary quadratic field. So now says conjecture over this imaginary quadratic field tells us that there should be uh, there should be some mod p homology. in this Bianchi manifold where you divide out by the level which is still n and but you also put p into the level. <clears throat> and so in particular it should be the case that whenever there is some mass form of eigenvalue a quarter on the modular curve then in some mysterious way this forces the existence of some p-torsion in this Bianchi manifold, where you increase the level at p a bit. So, but that's now purely on the analytic side of the statement. So. way to show that the mass form of Laplacian eigenvalue a quarter on H2 mod gamma of N forces P torsion in the homology. Of yeah. I guess there would be some way of showing this, then you could somehow try to reverse these arrows and actually construct this color representation. And it's very conceivable that this will actually work. Um, but it's somehow a very mysterious question still, because I mean, this mass form is a completely analytic object. It's just a system to some different. Differential equation, a solution to some differential equation. Um, and then it's supposed to force some p torsion homology. It's not so clear as it's supposed to work. But. This p torsion is not uh, coming from x to zero. I think it should be genuine p torsion in, in, in the generic case at least. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I want to say today. No, you just go up to the level of all p uh, levels and p, the power of all levels and p. That's right, but, uh, but then you. Then you have to use algebra to scale through everything. No, but what is the representation that you are going to do? The homology. What? The homology. The homology. The homology. The homology. No, the homology actually. So the homology is time to generate modulus of the algebra. And then you can study its co-dimensions and its core. One node is finitely generated module. It's a finitely generated module with the other module. So what you do is you, so the, <clears throat> so you look at the inverse limit of all n of the, uh, any level, you look at, uh, say, h3 of, come off p to the n times some k level, uh, we'll see the coefficient set. <coughs> and then this completed group ring or it was our algebra of uh, GLN of or OF and this chosen place P. Like on this guy, so that's the was our algebra. And I guess this inverse limit is called complete homology. <coughs> uh, 
And that's a part of the generator. <coughs> and that fixed value exponential growth. And uh, so in the case of um, uh, in this case of this is a major quadratic field and n is equal to 2, you can show that this is uh, 0 only in degree 0 sent 1, and non zero only in degree 0 sent 1, and in degree 1 it's of four dimension 1 over 0 above algebra. And knowing the four dimension is essentially equivalent to knowing how this grows. <coughs> subtle difference between inner and cuspidal cohomology at the level of automorphic forms you can tell in the way of cusp forms or something which is coming from the discrete the residual spectrum yes and this is reflected at the level of the Hecke eigenvalues mm -hmm. at some kind of jacket like a bound zone okay this circle of ideas do you see here at the level of uh, the well, I mean you can still define inner cohomology and so on but I'm not sure you can really find cuspidal cohomology so what is cuspidal cohomology k plus c0? It's a power coming from cuspidal automatic forms? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't think this is so easy to see. Um, so it's certainly possible that something which occurs in the inner cohomology of this guy gives rise to a reducible Gaul representation. Yeah, so actually I've, I've, yeah, I've thought of... But it might also be some kind of generic reducible Gaul representation. So it's, it's not necessarily the case that this Gaul representation is somehow just uh, the uh, some, some characters. <coughs> it could be two it. really different characters. Here. You localize the non I mean, the non license that I did precisely means that the Gaur representation is irreducible, so that's some kind of topological replacement. But. I mean, there's this notion of the non Eisenstein part of this cohomology, which is precisely the part where the star representation is irreducible. Uh -huh. And you can look at this part, but it's not clear how you can interpret this non Eisenstein part purely in terms of the automorphic side. In the usual Iwasawa theory, there is a difference between P and P versus P and L. But somehow you seem to look at torsion, which is also co prime to the level. I mean, you wrote well, that. I mean, I take the same key here and here. Yes, but you can also look at different primes. Yeah, but some of the most interesting cases I think is both here and here. But you have this very impressive example of a very large prime, which is in the torsion. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, you wrote yeah, that. Yeah, that's, so yeah, that's the case where you I think it's also useful to look at the case of these differences. The usual was both cases are studied, and I don't know. No, I'm not. I mean, you usually was studied. At least let's take the case of Philippe curves or Abelian varieties. Then what you would do is you would go up a tower where you attach the P to the end division points. Yes. So you are going up, and then you get you study the semi group, which becomes a module over. Corresponding uh, group rings, and then you take the inverse limit, you get a 
why do you write also like uh, I'm sorry, let's see here. You might also consider some of the inverse system of the elliptic curve is transitioned as multiplication by P. Correct, yes. And that's, oh, some, so of the, that's some of the analog of that, I think. Okay. All right. Okay, no further questions.